Maybe it's because Star Wars has many connections with Eastern religions and philosophies. Maybe it's because Star Wars is heavily inspired by the films of Akira Kurosawa. Or perhaps, Knights of the Old Republic 2's lead writer and designer, Chris Avalon, is an anime fan. Because every time I rewatch episodes of Rurouni Kenshin, I see similarities between it and KOTOR 2. The Boshin War was a civil conflict in Japan that usurped the ruling shogunate and restored political power to the emperor. The process in its entirety was known as the Meiji Restoration. Leading up to the days of open warfare, however, pro-imperialist influence was spreading. Revolutionaries began to plot against the Tokugawa shogunate. In response, the government began to crack down hard. The story of Ruroni Kenshin is centered around a wandering samurai named Kenshin Himura. He left his swordsmanship master and became an assassin for the imperialists of the Choshu domain. He killed so many people that he became known as Hitokiri Batosai, the Manslayer. Afterwards, he left Kyoto and wandered the land, vowing never to kill again, essentially going into self-imposed exile. In Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2, the Sith Lords, you canonically play as Mitra Surik, a Jedi Knight who served under Revan during the Mandalorian Wars. At the Battle of Malachor V, she was in charge of activating a superweapon, the Mass Shadow Generator. She gave the order and killed the thousands of Mandalorians, Republic soldiers, and Jedi alike. Afterwards, she returned to the Jedi Council and was subsequently excommunicated and exiled. Did you know that exile is a rare sentence? It is not really something that the Order can enforce. Believe it or not, it was really your choice. Years go by for both Kenshin and the Jedi Exile, until they are both brought back into the respective worlds they left behind, with the Meiji government seeking Kenshin's help and the Republic seeking the help of the Jedi Exile. Kenshin decides to help and travels back to Kyoto. Much like Revan after the Jedi Civil War, Kenshin leaves all of his companions behind. They both knew that against the enemies they went to fight, Having close allies would be a weakness that's easily exploited. He knew he must leave all loves behind as well, no matter how deeply one cares for them, because such attachments are not the way of the Jedi, and they would only bring doom to them both in the dark places where he now walks. In Kenshin's case, however, his friends knew exactly where he was going, so they followed him. And so what he feared would happen is exactly what ended up happening. While Kenshin was stuck inside a labyrinth fighting duels, the enemy launched an attack directly at the establishment his friends were all staying at. Then your allies are your weakness, and if they die, you die with them. And because of that, where once the Sith had but one target, now there are many, and you frustrate my attempts to protect you. While the Jedi exile gains a new teacher, Kenshin returns to his previous master, in an effort to finish the incomplete training, a style of swordsmanship called the Hiten Mitsurugi. This martial art not only contains many teachings similar to that of the Jedi, but also of the Sith. Among them, some teachings the Jedi and Sith would be wise to adopt. The Hiten Mitsurugi style will always guarantee victory to the side it chooses because of its superior strength. You are completely insignificant! The Hiten Mitsurugi style teaches that people should be protected in times of pain, much like the Jedi. Although the Jedi teach to help people in general, not just in quote-unquote times of pain. There's another caveat to the Hiten Mitsurugi style's ethics on helping people. It can only do it independently and neutral. It cannot belong or be a tool to any power. Kenshin's intentions were to help people. He was 14 years old, and under the guise of helping people, he became an assassin. In his first six months, he killed over a hundred people all for the political ambitions of imperialists, so that when open rebellions began in the form of total warfare, an imperialist victory is assured. Leaders unite, and when the leaders are removed, the unity they inspire erodes as well. Meanwhile, in Star Wars, the Jedi are taught to protect people, to be servants of the Force and of the Republic, and so they embedded themselves within the Republic, helping in whatever capacity they could and spreading their influence. 
The Republic was never what was important, ever. It was but a shell that surrounds the Jedi, just as the teachings of the Jedi are a shell surrounding the heart of man. The consequence of this was the creation of the Republic's dependency on the Jedi. Once the Mandalorian Wars began, the Republic approached the Jedi for aid, but the Council refused. Other Jedi began to speak up, proclaiming that the Jedi should support the war effort. After all, they were taught their entire lives that they should protect people. But even so, the Jedi Council forbade it. Two Jedi Knights, Revan and Malak, defied the Jedi Council. They challenged the Mandalorian fierceness and brutality on the battlefield with a viciousness of their own. The Jedi that followed Revan and Malak, probably in varying degrees, thought that it was the right thing to do. Kenshin Himura, Revan, Malak, and Mitra Sirk felt that with all the power they have, they had to do something. The Council taught and encouraged the Jedi to involve themselves in the everyday problems of the Republic and its people, but when the time came for their skill sets to truly be needed, they said no. They touted themselves servants of the Republic, but felt an unknown darkness, therefore billions had to die. A Nar Shaddaa, one cannot escape what was left from the Jedi Civil War. From the failure of the Masters, from our failure to properly train Jedi, came disaster. And I wondered if perhaps the teachings of the Jedi had been our failing all along. It is easy to cast blame, but it is perhaps time the Order accepted responsibility for their teachings and their arrogance and come to recognize that perhaps we are flawed. Nothing passes without consequence. Both the Jedi Exile and Kenshin Himura walked away with an extremely high body count among them. The Exile killed so many people so quickly that to avoid either dying or being consumed by the dark side, she cut herself off from the Force, and with such conviction that she became a wound in the Force. But no Jedi ever made the choice you did, to sever ties so completely, so utterly, that it leaves a wound in the Force. Kenshin killed so many people so often that he developed a psychological disorder. He would descend into an almost disassociative state, where he seemingly feels no emotion and has no sense of self-preservation, effectively cutting himself off from himself, from his true nature. I believe the condition manifested as a defense mechanism. It made him much more dangerous in a fight, but the true intention might have been to detach himself from all the violence he had to commit. This state of mind became known as Batosai the Manslayer, and in a way, you can see it as his version of the dark side. He wanted to help people, and he ended up filling graveyards. All the things I wanted to do, all the wrongs I wanted to right, I haven't done any of it. They just get farther and farther from my mind. Another consequence of their actions is having a hand in the creation of the very beings they now have to fight. The Jedi Exile used a mass shadow generator and inadvertently created Darth Nihilus. Kenshin Himura used the heat in Mitsurugi to such effectiveness and then left, leaving behind a power vacuum that inadvertently created Makoto Shishio. In a way, both the Jedi Exile and Kenshin Himura are fighting ghosts of the past. It is the echo of the past. It is the heartbeat of the past. Much like the Sith's Rule of Two, the Heat in Mitsurugi style limits itself to one master and one apprentice at a time. Near the end of the training, the master is tasked with teaching the student two techniques. The first is the Kuzu Ryusen, and the second is the ultimate attack of the Heat in Mitsurugi style. The master will attack the student using the Kuzu Ryusen. If the student can successfully break the master's attack using the Amakakaru Ryu no Hirameki, then the training is considered complete. When they first attempted it, Kenshin, not confident that he could do it, reverted to his manslayer state, telling his master that he's not afraid of dying. His master saw this and simply turned around and walked away. You can't master the Amakakeru Ryu no Hidameki as you are now. It's an attack that technically cannot be taught. It can only be gained through experience. It cannot be taught. It can only be gained through instinct, through experiencing its effects firsthand. Seijiro Hiko told Kenshin that he will eventually regress back into being Batosai, and he will use the Hiten Mitsurugi style to kill again. Then instead of teaching you the final attack, 
Ending your life will be my very last duty as your master. And so the master will attack the student using the Kuzuriusen, with every intention of killing them. Only when facing this experience is Kenshin able to realize that his lack of fear, emotion, and self-preservation was the critical flaw. A Jedi doesn't care if he dies. Kenshin had to understand that the secret was to discover both the significance and the insignificance of one's life. With one's life on the line, a human being will do anything to ensure the greatest goal in life, survival. The sheer will to live is what Kenshin needed to understand that you don't have to live. The world won't come to an end and the universe won't collapse in on itself without you there. It's about wanting to live. That is the greatest source of power that made the Jedi exile wholly refuse the force and made Kenshin Himura defeat his master. Passing the test, however, is not without consequence. The apprentice must kill the master. If you do not, I will kill you. If I do not, then all you have achieved will be as nothing. The only way to know for certain that the student has mastered the Hiten Mitsurugi style is to kill the teacher. Only then can we know that the training is complete, that they have dominated the teachings, and are worthy of usurping the master, becoming the new Seishiro Hiko. Despite the Meiji Restoration being presented to the public as a noble endeavor that is good for all, Throughout the show, they present the audience with stories involving the Meiji government doing highly questionable things. The main antagonist of the arc only exists because the Meiji government tried to kill him. To keep their use of assassins quiet, they shot him and burned him alive. It seems that the argument is that all Kenshin did was help trade in one evil for another. I cannot force you to listen to reason, only hope that you will grow past these infantile delusions of right and wrong. Disconnected from the lens of good and evil, and examining different administrations throughout history, the sad conclusion is that, more often than not, that's exactly what happens. Given the technology that was available at the time in feudal Japan, there wasn't easy access to information like we have today. Propaganda was all the more pervasive, with the people never hearing any counterarguments. Meaning does not exist a priori. It is order imposed by individuals with arsenals of communication devices. One of Kenshin's friends, Sanosuke Sagara, was on the receiving end of that quote. As a child, he greatly admired the people of the Sekihotai, a militia of farmers and merchants that arose after the Battle of Tobofushimi, but they were used as pawns by the Revolutionary Army and subsequently betrayed, arrested, and executed. Filled with vengeance, Sanosuke became a mercenary fighter and took his frustrations out on his targets. It took Kenshin to convince him that despite the many flaws of the current government, it's merely a stepping stone to perhaps one day reach the ideals that the revolutionaries believed in. Technically they did, but it took several more wars including two world wars to do it. While following Kenshin to Kyoto, Sanosuke encounters a fallen Buddhist monk who teaches him a fighting technique. The Futai no Kewami. It is revealed that Anji is a member of Makoto Shishio's special forces, the Jubungatana. Anji inevitably faces Sanosuke in combat, a fight that's very reminiscent of the Jedi Exile's fight with the Sith Lord, Darth Sion. You seek to weaken me, to erode my will. You will not succeed. Anji tells Sanosuke about his last days of being a Buddhist monk. He ran a temple populated by a group of orphans whose shogunate-aligned parents were killed in the Boshin Wars. He grew very close to them and considered them family. But circumstances surrounding anti-Buddhist sentiment and shogunate allegiance during the war worried the town mayor that they won't receive any federal aid money. The town mayor told Anji that they will need to leave and the temple torn down. But the following night, the mayor set fire to the temple, with the children still inside. Anji's family had burned alive. Overflowing with vengeance, he renounced his fate to Buddha, killed the men responsible, and became Anji the Destroyer, adopting a mindset that dictates that the only path to salvation is constant destruction and rebuilding. Everyone is made up of events in their past, 
and it forms walls around one's spirit or breaks such walls down. The mind makes some powerless and gives strength to others. Reciting the story motivates Anji to win at any cost. Hearing the parallels between Anji's tale and his own motivates Sanosuke to do the same. A strike that was previously a one-shot attack is rendered ineffective, as both combatants refuse to fall, transforming the physical conflict into a battle of words. Make him doubt himself, his beliefs, or his intentions. Such things disrupt connections to the Force, and death soon follows. The only question is what belief or intention he holds dear that would make an effective target. Sanosuke's words made Anji realize how wrong he's been, how consumed by vengeance he's become. With this, he loses his will and reason to fight, and is essentially redeemed, turning back to the light. And the greatest of victories are not manipulations at all, but simply awakening others to the truth of what you believe, of hearing it echoed around you in life. Unlike Anji and Sonosuke, the fight between Kenshin and Shishio came down to a battle of flesh, directly due to the differences in philosophical ideologies. Politically though, I'm not sure. Shishio's ironclad, the Purgatory, is easily compared to Darth Nihilus' ship, the Ravager. But Shishio is no Nihilus. Shishio's goal was not exactly senseless death. Beyond wanting revenge, Shishio was also dissatisfied with the Meiji government. Being ideologically opposed, he believed that the country would be better served with him in control. It was the 10th year of the Meiji government, 1879. Japan was in the process of modernization, but Shishio's interest in petroleum tells me that he wanted Japan to do more than play catch up with the other nations. He most likely believed that Japan could surpass them, end their dependency on coal and switch to petroleum as a fuel source before the other nations. He wanted Japan to be the strongest, for reasons that line up perfectly with his core belief. In the end, only the fittest survive in this world. If you're strong, you live. If you're weak, you die. This of course is a bastardization of what Charles Darwin meant with survival of the fittest, whose book by the way, On the Origin of Species, was published in 1859, 20 years before these events, and western science was being imported to Japan, especially from the Dutch. But Darwin was referring to a species' ability to adapt to survive, not murder. Nowadays killing people is so easy, a toddler could do it. And they do. If survival of the fittest is as simple as the strong killing the weak, then the inevitable conclusion. Sooner or later humans will kill off all the Enshe, all dwarves and gnomes. Then they'll start murdering one another. Your kind knows no other way. It's in your genes. You'll keep killing each other until only one remains, the strongest among you. A thousand years from now, a dim-witted human barbarian will climb to the top of a pile of bones, sit down and proclaim, I win. A Japanese empire led to the Sino-Japanese Wars, the invasion of Korea, the invasion of Manchuria, the Russian-Japanese War, the invasion of Taiwan twice, and World War II, among other conflicts. The fact that Shishio, a private citizen, could purchase and import an entire battleship shows the failings of the Meiji government's security efforts. Despite all its flaws, Shishio's ideology would have most likely dictated a totalitarian state and even more foreign wars to conquer the quote-unquote weak. But we'll never know for sure now. Even at the end, Kenshin explains that their ideology isn't necessarily right just because they won. You must understand that the general would not wish the relics or the Sith strength here on Malachor to be compromised. Their presence is needed to stabilize the galaxy. Without them, the galaxy would be reduced to anarchy within years. And if there is anything I can't stand, it's an untidy galaxy. The fight with Shishio didn't come down to political or philosophical debate. It was a battle of flesh, not ideals. Nowadays we've realized that with the technology we have now, we can't maintain large-scale warfare to settle our differences. We adapt to find other solutions. Despite humanity's talent for adaptation, however, it doesn't mean it's easy. Technological advancements are far surpassing cultural ones. The Jedi should learn to adapt too. And even though they are very much inspired by the ways of the samurai, 
they ended up as traditional samurai, working for a lord, they should see that perhaps they're better off as ronin. I've never seen Ruroni Kenshin in the original Japanese. I wonder if anything was lost or added in translation. As a kid, I used to watch the first dubbing called Samurai X. It wasn't until I got access to American Cartoon Network and saw Toonami that I discovered Ruroni Kenshin. But anyway, that's enough for me. This is the last time I'm uploading this. YouTube completely blocked the original video, so I was forced to rework it from scratch. Call me a weeb in the comments section again and tell me what you think about all this. Is the Jedi Samurai influence showing itself, or is Chris Avalon an anime fan? Please consider subscribing, following me on social media, and joining us over at the Discord server. Links for everything are in the description below. Until next time, thanks for watching.